everybody and welcome to today's um, event, uh, the latest in our CTPSR webinar series, uh, which will be um, given by Associate Professor Pamina Fershaw. This is the, the latest in a number of um, webinar series events that we've been given and uh, we're, we're very excited about um, uh, hearing today about um, Pamina's research into everyday peace indicators. Uh, for now, I will hand over to Laura Payne, who will introduce Pamina. Hello, thank you, Stephen. Um, so I'm Laura Payne from uh, CTPSR, and I have the pleasure today of introducing Dr. Furcho. Um, and when Stephen asked me, I have to say I was absolutely delighted because I have been following Pamina's work for um, quite a few years now, and it's actually inspired some work that we've been doing with Islamic Relief. Um, and Pamina's work, she's the Associate Professor of Coexistence and Conflict at Brandeis University, currently in Italy, Italy though, I just discovered, so <laughs> sure we can all be envious at the moment that our Yorkshire storms are um, blowing a gale outside, so if my internet goes, I apologise, but it's almost certainly the weather. Dr. Furcho is uh, Associate Professor of Coexistence and Conflict, as I said, um, and she looks specifically at how international organisations um, accompany local actors within places where there's active conflict. Um, and one aspect of her work is around um, everyday peace indicators, which is a, uh, a term that she coined actually with her colleague, um, Professor Roger McGinty. And this looks at participatory numbers and mixed methods approaches to evaluating um, peace building interventions. I hope I'm capture, capturing this um, appropriately, um, Pamina. Um, and she has a book in 2018 um, around the uh, concept of everyday peace indicators, which actually I have here. And I was just explaining to Pamina that I was fortunate enough to get this out of the library by chance just before the pandemic. And since then it's been on auto renew. So having had it two years now, I feel like possession is nine tenths of the law and it's actually my book. Um, but it does mean that over two years, I've had quite a few opportunities to go back period periodically recap a few things. It's been so helpful in my work as I've been putting together um, evaluation strategies and things like this, thinking about the ethos of that and how we can try to integrate the uh, participants of projects into that process. Um, so I am uh, thrilled to be here today and to be introducing Pamina and I think um, we will all have a lot to learn from her presentation. So without further ado, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Laura and Stephen and Gwyneth. Um, it's a real honor to be here and I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking to you. So I'm going to get started. I have a presentation. So as Laura said, I'm um, an associate professor at uh, Brandeis University and um, I'm in the Heller School for Social Policy. Um, and I teach in the Coexistence and Conflict Resolution uh, Master's Program that's in the Heller School. Um, but I'm also the founding executive director of the Everyday Peace Indicators NGO. We started an NGO in 2018 um, and it has been growing um, ever since then with various projects um, that are routed through the NGO as well as through the university. So today's presentation, um, I'm going to take you through by just uh, talking a little bit at first about um, what indicators are and why we need everyday peace indicators. And then I'll do a brief overview of the methodology and the steps involved in the EPI process. And we'll uh, then continue on um, by giving some examples of the projects that we have and the usages for everyday peace indicators. So generally, indicators help us to specify a systematized concept. Um, so a, a, a systemized concepts meaning um, and also determine what needs to be measured in order to track progress and determine outcomes. So what is a systemized concept? A systemized concept is a term that Adcock and Collier, who are political scientists working on measurement, call a concept that's being measured. 
And indicators are really fundamental um, and they're a fundamental tool for operationalizing concepts into systematized concepts. Um, so these indicators um, set a concept's meaning, um, they determine what needs to be measured, um, they, then they can track projects, um, uh, progress, as well as determine outcomes. Um, so who determines or who decides, right? Who decides, who chooses the indicators? Well, typically we see that generally when um, um, putting together measurement projects or evaluations or um, putting together an index, for example, you have researchers or experts and outsiders who determine what the indicators should be. Um, they do, they determine the indicators either by using expert knowledge, uh, by literature, um, or by setting priorities. Um, so we can see, for example, um, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals indicators are chosen um, in large part um, through a process of, of setting priorities. They're rarely uh, chosen or really um, involve uh, in the inclusion of people that we're say, trying to say something about. Um, so um, it's very rare that they are engaged in determining indicators for measurement or evaluation. Uh, why is it necessary to have um, something uh, like everyday peace indicators? Well, measurement um, is, is often insufficient. Um, in complex contexts, um, especially those affected by large scale violence and different regions and areas and even villages may be affected differently by war, which means that the response has to be different as well. And if the goal is in, measure, in measurement is um, to encourage pro progress, then it's important to recognize that progress looks different depending on context. Also, um, concepts can be difficult to, def to define, especially social concepts um, like peace, development, inequality, or uh, ecological issues such as sustainability. So a mix of indicators that are both top down as well as bottom up is necessary. Um, unfortunately, in most cases, we see really only more top-down or externally created indicators included in measurement systems. So uh, it's important to find better ways to measure difficult uh, to define social science concepts um, like peace uh, and really any other difficult to define concept. Um, and so we can do that by actually including the people and the communities that live and embody um, what we're measuring. So the communities can define their own piece um, that often also requires a lot of um, uh, complexity um, and can involve um, highly politicized uh, processes. So a little bit about what EPI is. Um, so EPI is a systematic process, a systematic methodology for capturing social concepts that are difficult to define and therefore measure. Uh, again, these broad concepts um, need conceptual clarification. And so there's a lot of decision-making that's behind um, that process. And that decision-making often doesn't include those we're saying something about. Um, and so we are creating, um, and we are part of a larger ecosystem of uh, something that's called participatory numbers or participatory statistics. In the process of creating participatory numbers or st statistics, um, it's necessary to include um, everyday people, not just as data sources, but also as, um, as, as co-creators of the tools necessary to measure them or to create those statistics. And we attempt to um, bridge epistemological um, and methodological divisions that are related to measurement um, without going into too much detail because there's a huge body of literature behind this. Um, it essentially, what we are trying to do is to 
attend to the concerns of interpretivists about measurement issues while acknowledging the needs of positivists. Um, so acknowledging the need of, to, to measure, um, but at the same time, understanding that measurement can be relative. And um, importantly, we, um, our, our strength and our emphasis and our focus really is on um, the local level. And when we say local, we mean the village or the neighborhood. Um, so it is a participatory collaborative process um, that comes from the bottom up that involves everyday people in villages or neighborhoods. And for the most part is measuring these concepts at the village or neighborhood level. So this is um, just a quick slide that shows uh, the places where we've worked and also maybe gives you a little bit of more clarity when I was saying earlier, peace or peace related concepts. Um, what I meant was that we don't just work with the concept of peace. We're not just creating peace indicators, um, but we create indicators of justice, create, uh, we create indicators of coexistence, um, violent extremism, security, resilience, um, uh, and, and other concepts um, that we uh, are still um, continuing to um, develop. Like for example, we're just starting a project in California and in that project, we're gonna be working on um, indicators of well-being. And we recently conducted a project in Bosnia where we um, decided to work the concept of living together because the concepts of coexistence and reconciliation were too politicized. So there's um, always a negotiation and a discussion and a pretty extensive thought process behind um, the, the, um, the choice of the concept that we are going in to measure. Um, but you can see, that uh, we've been working in communities in, in multiple different countries around the world. So I'm going to now briefly go over the steps in the everyday peace indicators process or the methodology. Um, so you can see that there are four main steps, um, beginning with indicator generation, which is um, focus groups. Um, and those focus groups um, are convened generally we convene one group of men, one group of women, and one group of youth per community. Um, sometimes we split up the youth and have one group of girls and one group of boys, depending on the context. Um, the focus groups are representative of the community. Um, so rep rep representative of the locality, the village or the neighborhood. So in the focus groups, it's um, discussions with community members that start really with very basic questions like what does peace mean in your community? Um, but really what we're working towards is finding um, those tangible signs that we look to in our, in our communities to determine whether or not we are at peace. So what do you look to in your daily life to determine whether you are more or less at peace? So these are the tangible signs um, that uh, you may see in your community, you may see um, uh, actions, you may see actual um, um, uh, concrete things like roads being built, etc. that may um, make you feel de or determine whether you are more or less at peace. Um, and then at, once we um, have these discussions with community members, um, lists are created um, of the indicators that have been developed in those discussions. And when, once the lists are uh, created, we have a second step, which is the verification and voting process. And in the verification and voting process, uh, we the community members come together first verify the lists. So we have a variety of different issues that come up when we transfer the focus group discussions into indicator lists. And so we have to ensure that we are translating them correctly and in the way that um, participants intended. And so um, 
uh, in those verification sessions, there are a series of questions and clarifications. And those verification sessions are with the original focus group participants. Um, and then in the voting process, we invite um, the broader community and um, there's a voting process where uh, individuals are given votes to vote for their top indicators of, let's say, peace in their community. And um, generally speaking, we give individuals between um, 10 to 15, 10 to 20 votes, um, often, usually 15 votes um, to vote for their individual indicators. And the um, and that results in approximately um, 100 indicators per community. Um, the indicators are then uh, collated, uh, the votes are recorded. Um, we also have a process where we give different color votes to different individuals. So men get one color, uh, women get another and youth get another so that we can record what group is voting for what indicators. We also, of course, record what indicators come from which groups so that we can then analyze later if, for example, one group's indicators were prioritized over others. So you're probably wondering at this point what some examples are of indicators, and I've put a few together um, and on uh, three slides, one from Afghanistan, one from Sri Lanka, one from Colombia, just to give you some illustration of individualized indicators that we collect. Um, this slide in particular, I think shows um, how diverse the indicators are. Everything from women riding with their husbands on motorcycles to singing songs at wedding ceremonies to antennas on rooftops um, that indicate that there's less uh, presence of violent extremism to observing a fuel station staying open during the night um, to seeing also female vaccinators coming to the village. So you can see the different issues that people will bring up when asked about um, their everyday indicators of peace. In these uh, examples from Sri Lanka, and this is just you know a little um, cherry picking of, of um, some examples from each um, from some communities in each uh, context. But I chose these in particular because they demonstrate how detailed our indicators can be. Um, so they can really tell you specific road names or locations or, or identify specific issues that are going on in a community, um, which can be interesting for um, research purposes, but is particularly useful for programming and planning, for working with, um, with peace building actors um, to be able to demonstrate, especially if it's a highly voted indicator, that there's a very specific issue um, that needs to be attended to. And here you can see a collection of various different indicators um, and, and indicators collected around the peace process time uh, or the peace agreement time in Colombia um, just afterwards. Um, and really this focus on um, community action and relationship to the, um, the peace accord that was signed in 2016. So once we um, collect these indicators and once we have the lists and votes uh, collated, we, as you can see, have really detailed um, narratives really through these indicators for each community. And the individual indicators can uh, serve a purpose and, and be um, very rich and um, give a lot of detail. Um, and as I said, tell a narrative. But at the same time, there's a lot of them. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's uh, often up to 100, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on uh, the community. And so you can imagine that it's a, it's a lot to process and a lot to analyze. So what we do is we code the indicators um, and we code them using a variety of different processes. Um, so we code them both using inductive and deductive processes. Um, so we have, you can see here on the right, the indicators. Um, and we begin by looking at the indicators and for each project or um, location, we create a code book. And we do that by looking at the indicators and um, taking out themes from the indicators and creating categories and subcategories. 
And those categories and subcategories, um, essentially, I mean, they tell the story um, at a at a little bit of a at a little bit of a more of a distance than these very um, very detailed um, and also um, very uh, vernacularized everyday indicators. And the categories allow for some distance. Um, they and and they also allow for the language to be converted to some extent into more policymaker. Um, themes, so you know, themes like security, for example, etc. And we also do a deductive uh, coding process, um, which is the dimension level, um, because with the categories, as you'll see in a minute, um, it allows us to compare across communities. Um, we want to also compare across uh, locations. So compare Sri Lanka with Colombia, for example. And you can't do that if you have different categories in every place. Um, and so the dimension level allows us to have a set, a set uh, six dimensions that um, we categorize all of our indicators into to be able to then eventually compare across countries. So what is the purpose of the coding? Well, the purpose of the coding, as I said, um, is comparison. Um, so with the dimensions across projects, but with the um, categories within the project. I mean, each, each village has a different set of indicators. So how do we compare um, villages? We can't compare them just with the indicators. We have to compare them using um, the category coding. It also allows us to demonstrate overarching themes and to compare those themes and categories. So to say, so for example, um, that one community prioritizes security over development when defining everyday peace. And it also allows us to demonstrate priorities and needs um, in a, as I said, in, in a language that's maybe more comfortable or understandable for policymakers and practitioners. So here are um, the six uh, dimensions um, and some examples of categories that, um, uh, that are coded into the dimensions. Um, but as I said, the categories can change from context to context. And if this is really interesting to you, um, we have uh, several code books um, available online. We'll have more soon. We're developing um, also a little bit more um, of a detailed code book on the dimensions coding. Um, but right now, I think there's four or five code books available um, so that you can download and see exactly you know, how we code them and how we um, define the various different categories. And also, um, I, me I, didn't, I meant to mention that the coding process involves typically three coders. Um, we code with um, uh, coding teams that are with that are familiar with the context, um, but also um, individuals that are less familiar with the context, because that really creates a very rich process of coding because it um, is a discussion. Every coder codes all of the indicators. And so that means that um, there's a process of negotiation um, at one point, you know, where maybe one coder has coded something into a category that the others disagree with. Um, it also uh, means that we don't have to establish any intercoder reliability scores. Finally, in most projects, but not all, we also um, conduct surveys. And um, those surveys allows, allow us to um, track change over time. Um, they're typically longitudinal. Um, so we ask questions, we convert just like with any survey that's based on indicators, we convert the indicators into questions and ask the questions um, uh, using a Likert scale. Um, so one to five Likert scale. Often, I mean, oftentimes we uh, also include demographic questions and questions about interventions and things like that um, so that we can then um, track change over time um, and attribute it also to various demographics um, and, and attribute it also to different kinds of interventions that have happened in, in various communities. Okay, so I, I wanted to end by talking a little bit about um, 
what everyday peace indicators um, can be used for. And really it has quite a lot of uses. Um, and so this part of the presentation is always difficult for me because I want to present another hour's worth of material. But of course, um, that's not possible in most presentations. So I'm going to give you a little snapshot. Um, so EPI is a research methodology, as I said, so we produce research. Um, it's a design monitoring and evaluation tool. So planning tool, as well as an evaluation tool of an applied tool. It's a, it can be a measurement tool and it can be an advocacy and organizing tool. So how is it a research methodology? Well, um, it's a research methodology because it can be deployed or, um, or used uh, to gather data in a systematic way to, to ask questions about theory and literature um, from a different perspective. And uh, it provides an approach that is both quantitative, but also inclusive. If it's accompanied by also qualitative uh, work, it's um, it's very rich. It can be very rich and 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 is a mixed methods um, approach. So you can see that I've published uh, a book using the everyday peace indicators process to um, say things about peace building effectiveness at a local level. Um, but we have since the book was published um, as Laura mentioned it was published in 2018 we've been really working much more on um, we've focused much less now on developing the methodology and really focused much more now on using the methodology to say things um, to to gather empirical data to say things about um, questions that um, it may be emerging out of the literature um, that may be related to um, particular concerns that are emerging from the data analysis. Um, and these are, are, are some examples of publications that have been recently published or are um, in process. I wanted to highlight one as an example. Um, this is uh, just an example also that allows you to see a little bit how EPI can be used. So as I said, um, EPI, Everyday Peace Indicators, is a methodology, um, but as any methodology can be plugged into a research design. So this is the example of a research design in our Everyday Justice Project in Colombia, where um, we have uh, where we're looking at various different, so on the right column there, those are all um, different mechanisms of the peace accord. And, um, and what we're looking at is how effective are those um, mechanisms that emerged out of the peace accord according to um, standards developed by everyday people. So, I mean, again, very briefly, um, this project has allowed us also to look at, you know, how do people conceptualize coexistence and how do they conceptualize justice? Um, and you can see how we can um, analyze this using, for example, in this case, uh, the dimensions, but of course we can also analyze it using the categories. Categories can get a little bit busy. So I use the example of the dimensions here to make it more straightforward. So. So for example, here, you know, you can see that people um, emphasized uh, culture and society um, significantly when they were defining their everyday just uh, coexistence, sorry. Um, and and um, also emphasized security, whereas for justice, dealing with the past was more important as, as well as rights and dignity. So moving on to um, design monitoring and evaluation, um, we are also working on various different projects on design monitoring and evaluation, so planning and um, engaging civil society actors on how we might adapt EPI as a tool for them, as well as how, as, as conducting evaluations ourselves. So there's um, a grounded accountability tool project, which is a community of practice um, with uh, some Colombian NGOs, as well as Search for Common Ground and Humanity United. And, um, and it's really looking at, you know, how can we adapt EPI? Because I mean, as you've seen now, it's quite an involved process and requires a good deal of accompaniment and experience. So how can, is it possible to adapt this um, for, for organizations to use um, 
in their monitoring evaluation work or in their programming work and how. Um, so that's a community practice and a project that we have been um, undertaking with these various um, partners to be able to understand um, how we might be able to adapt EPI and also how that might differ for different kinds of organizations. So for like an international NGO versus a community-based organization, et cetera. Um, of course, we also conduct our own um, evaluations and our own um, planning um, guidance projects. One example is a project that we have in Sri Lanka. And really, I mean, this is this was a little hard for me to um, just focus on monitoring evaluation because most of the projects that we are involved in have research value and that's why we're involved in them. Um, our interest is to also engage in the projects because of the research value. So for example, this project is a project with USAID and the US Institute of Peace um, where we're working with um, uh, the implementers. Um, it's an implementing an international NGO called Global Communities. Um, to accompany them and, um, and provide them guidance on programming in the communities where we work. So you can see the clusters there. Um, we have what's called a treatment communities. So the communities that are receiving interventions from global communities um, versus the, the um, control communities that are not. Um, and that allows for the evaluative aspect um, over time. So this is quite a long project, five plus years. And so it allows us to not only collect indicators and then track change longitudinally over time, but also allows for another round of indicator generation, which we're entering into uh, now this spring, um, to be able to then compare you know, how after uh, the first round of indicators was collected in 2018, how do those indicators uh, compare to the indicators that were collected in 2018, especially after um, a global a uh, pandemic, a terrorist attack, a uh, coup in Sri Lanka, do they change? How do they change? Um, and how is, that, uh, how is that important? So you can see also the research value of this, this project. But of course, it also provides guidance um, for implementing activities um, and then for, for evaluative purposes for the uh, reconciliation programming um, of USAID and global communities. And then we also uh, have projects that are interested in measurement, um, more broadly speaking. So zooming out a little bit from the uh, monitoring and evaluation, asking we have one project where we're asking questions about, is it possible to scale up a bottom up um, process like everyday peace indicators that's really just focused on individual villages and, and neighborhoods? Um, is it possible to say something, for example, for an indigenous group? So in this case, we're doing this project with the Pasto Indigenous Group um, on the border of Ecuador in, there in Colombia and two um, states of Colombia and looking at the potential for scaling up. We have um, and other projects where we're looking at how do bottom-up indicators um, compare to top-down indicators. So this is an example of an analysis where we took two reconciliation barometers in Colombia and coded them into our Everyday Peace Indicators codebook. Um, and you can see then how the other barometers compare to the Everyday Peace Indicators um, Barometer. They basically the indicators that we collected. This is compared to the indicators that we collected in Antioquia, which is one state in Colombia. And and you know how how does that fall? How does it compare? Um, you can see that definitely um, there's much more variety within the EPI um, indicators. The EPI indicators fall within multiple different categories and uh, and fall more within multiple categories than um, the other reconciliation barometers do. The other reconciliation barometers are more focused in particular areas um, for, for one it, with dealing, dealing with the past, whereas uh, for, for another, for culture and society. And finally, um, EPI also provides um, an advocacy and organizing tool for communities. So I've talked a lot about outsiders, measurement issues, guidance and planning and things like that, but what about the community? I mean, we're collecting indicators with community members. Can the community use the indicators themselves? And we found um, that a challenge, um, to be honest, because in, in, 
in, in many ways, EPIs are extractive. We're going from community to community, extracting these indicators for um, various different purposes than for the community. So we found that working um, with uh, other methodologies, like for example, photo voice, um, has provided us the opportunity to really engage community members more. So photo voice is a participatory process um, that uh, uses essentially photography in many different ways um, to capture um, needs and priorities and um, understandings of um, everyday people. And the, we found that um, the photo voice methodology has been very complementary with our everyday peace indicators process, because although everyday peace indicators is inclusive, it's participatory, as I said, it's extractive and really more than anything, it's collaborative, right? It's very set and structured. It is a systematic process, whereas photo voice is much more open-ended. So by doing the everyday peace indicators process and then coming back to the community with a photo voice team that is structured around the everyday peace indicators, we are, we're able um, to work with the community to visualize um, the indicators and to also think about um, how those indicators really apply to their communities and where they can actually act on those um, indicators, because of course many of the indicators they can't do anything about because they speak to other actors, you know, government actors, NGO actors, etc., um, where or international actors. Whereas um, some um, they they can act on. So in this, um, here are some examples. Um, so you can see on the bottom right the community with the support of the church and the hack uh, maintain the cemetery. So this is. Um, um, a picture of the cemetery, and this is not really an example of where a community um, was involved in this EPI photo voice work and acted. Um, they, they identified uh, the issue, an issue that they could do something about that was important to them for their everyday coexistence. And, um, and then through that process, actually galvanized the community to work with them with the group that was doing the photo voice EPI project um, to clean up the cemetery. And there's other on the bottom left, you can see um, there, there are other examples where other communities have also used um, uh, the, this process to identify issues to then advocate for uh, change with local pol uh, policymakers. So for example, trash was a problem and that really was a problem for them in terms of um, uh, their everyday coexistence. And, um, and so they were able to use the everyday indicator process and the everyday and the photo voice to demonstrate to policymakers that this was an issue and to really um, push them to change. So um, I hope uh, this gave you a good overview of um, everyday peace indicators. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're out of time, which is a shame because I think we could have kept going for <laughs> at least another half an hour.